Ladies, how many of you are married to the perfect husband? Just raise your hand. You're just so perfect. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. Men, let me, let me just come get a microphone and get a testimony of how in the world. Wow, that's impressive. Well, okay, so you're dismissed from listening to the message. That's pretty good. Either that or you want a diamond ring or something. I don't know which it is. But anyway, we are delighted you're here this morning. We're going to dive into the topic and talking about what it means to be a man of God. We're going to talk about being a dad later on. We're going to talk about this this morning about this. But let me encourage you, today is an elbow-free message. Right? So ladies, just put your hands in your pockets. Don't be tempted to give this or this. Or I've been trying to tell you, right? This is a free uh, message for them to listen to, engage. Now, later on, then I'm going to challenge you, and I'm going to challenge myself. And, uh, and I haven't done anything yet with my wife, so she's the first time she's heard the message. I haven't told her anything about it other than she saw the points and approved and said that would, that would pass. Um, but I want you to ask your spouse this week. I want to challenge you to ask your spouse, how are you doing in these areas? Okay? Now, I'm going to overwhelm you and give you 12 this morning because here's what I know. Some of you are doing really well in some areas, but other areas you might want to improve in. So I want to challenge you in each of these areas that you would be willing to look at your spouse and in love and in trust, look at them and say, listen, how could I do better? How could I uh, more uh, be a better husband in these particular areas, right? So I, we're going to have some fun this morning. i got a couple of video clips to share with you. and uh, We're going to laugh a little bit along the way. If you're a lady this morning going, well, what does that have to do with me? Let me encourage you. Let me, this is the things I would encourage you to do, and that is that you would pray for your husband to have these qualities in his life. And if there are things that are of shortcoming in some of those particular areas, my challenge would be when you communicate and y'all talk and he asks you about these things, that you lovingly share those things with him, but you also commit to pray for him. And this is not an opportunity to also, ladies, to give you a, a nag session opportunity, right? To tell him, again, all the things he should be doing and what he's not doing. But instead, you commit to pray for him in those areas. I'm going to tell you one of the greatest things I ever have, and I don't have my other Bible with me. It was at the house this morning due to all of our air conditioner snafus. It didn't make it with me. But in my Bible, I have a, I have a letter from my wife. It's in there. It's a letter she wrote me uh, back in August of, um, August of 2011, I guess it was. And it's a very precious letter to me because it talks about some specific things that I needed her to pray for me about. And she put it in writing. And I say it, it's still in my Bible. I, I, I look at it regularly. Because it was so significant for me to know that my wife was praying for me. So I want to encourage you, ladies, as you listen. For those of you who are single uh, ladies or you are college age, you're a student. I want you to listen and say, God, begin to pray now. Would you give me a husband, if you so choose, Lord, to, that I would be married, that, that they would have these qualities. Now, this is not an, an end-all defining qualities list, right? But these are things that I think are important that we could think about together and look at together. Now, our culture in this day and age we live in demonizes men almost in so many ways, right? We all learned the word misogynist. I'd never heard of that word. I can't spell that word. I had to look it up in a dictionary to figure out what in the world the word meant. But we've, we've used this word a lot. It's thrown around a whole heck of a lot lately. Matter of fact, the American Psychological Association has discovered miraculously just this last year that traditional masculinity needs to be stopped. It needs to be done away with. We need, to, we need to try to get rid of those things. And some of the things they address, certainly I would not disagree with. The idea that, we, that men would be abusive. This idea that men would be men and who God created to be though. And this idea of trying to neutral our gender identity and to make it one gender. Is straight from the pits of hell itself. God has made men and women differently with different roles with different kinds of views on life, right? And it's the greatest mystery of all. That's why Peter talks about it, or Paul talks about the mystery of the church. We're talking about Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, the mystery of marriage and how God puts a man and a woman together is, is really a mystery. Because we know the case, the truth is, we are vastly different. Ladies, if I could speak on behalf of men, we do not understand you. We love you, we like you, but we do not understand you. Now, I would invite my wife up and she would say, I will speak to all the ladies. We don't understand you either, right? We don't understand each other very well. But what I want you to see is, is that God's word is very clear that it is okay to be a masculine man. Now, how we define masculinity sometimes can be a little skewed as well, right? We, we think about the age I grew up and now they're bringing him back one more time. You know you've reached a certain age when they start redoing movies you saw when you were a kid, right? 
or you knew about when you were a kid. I probably didn't see Rambo movies. I wasn't allowed to watch those movies, but I knew of Rambo, right? I've seen him later on, but uh, clips here and there. But, but now that's the new and latest, it's the last Rambo. That's what it's called. The la- I thought, yeah, if he doesn't die in the next 20 years, it's the last one because they'll bring back another one. But Rambo, that was the idea of masculinity. All those characters, all those movie guys back in the day, that's how you define masculinity, right? Jason Bourne, right? You think about the, the, the movie characters that define what we might consider masculine. And that's not what masculinity necessarily means. That can be a part of it. But that's not certainly all of it. But what does God describe as a man who is filling the role that God has intended for him and for me, for any man to hear what that means? So my my encouragement to you, men, is this is not a sermon to beat us up. This isn't a sermon to condemn you, make you feel guilty about what you're not doing. All of us know there are things that we're not doing, right? Now, if, if, ladies, if your husbands are not here, right, um, encourage them to go watch the, the message later on this week. We get it posted. And vice versa, men, if your wife's not here, I'll be sure to pass it along to them so they don't miss the opportunity to, to share with you and all that, those beautiful things, right? But I want to encourage you that men, that this is a challenge for us to rise up and be men of courage and of conviction. Men of compassion and men of character. To be men who serve and love. Men who walk humbly with God. And so Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians, he's ending the, 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 the last letter there in chapter 16, he's talking about Apollos, and then he, he inserts these two verses, which I think are so very powerful. Listen to what they say in verse 13 and 14 of chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. Here's what it says. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. He's telling these men in Corinth to act like a man. Now, behind that, the understanding is a man of God, right? Because acting like a man, how our culture defines it sometimes, is not necessarily correct. And part of that description is be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, be strong. Verse 14, let all that you do be done in love. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the foundation of which we've laid this message series talking about what it is that we define. We focus on what matters most. Loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We forge our family in the truth of God. We teach them. We show them. We model it to them. We demonstrate to them what it means to follow God. We, we encourage us as we not forget uh, God and f- not follow his commands and follow after the wrong things. That's not God's intent for us as he warned the Israelites. But we must choose to follow his way to fortify the faith of the generation that is coming behind us, our children, our grandchildren. We teach them what it means and what it looks like to follow Christ. And finally, we have to fear the Lord. You know, I've watched, it's the time of year we're starting to preview all the new fall TV shows, Right? And I keep waiting for, for, for somebody in Hollywood to wake up and realize that all of us would like to maybe from time to time watch a family sitcom, perhaps like we had back when we were kids, that actually shows a normal family living a normal life. But instead we have all these wild shows they create. Typically men are idiots. That's just the nicest way to say it. They're buffoons. They have no idea what they're doing. They don't know how to be a, a husband or a dad. The kids are 14 times smarter than the parents. The parents, both of them are stupid. They don't know how to do anything right. And so this reality of what our culture is more than willing to fill in the gaps for your kids to show them what it means to be a man. And our, my challenge for us It's how your sons are going to know how to be a godly husband. It's how you treat your wife. Always have said this throughout the years, in the 30 years I've been in ministry. I would always tell ladies, watch how he treats his parents. Because that's how he's going to treat you. Watch how he respects his mother. Right? Right? Watch and see who his dad is. Those are important things to observe. Now, the four steps on each message, I continue to remind you of these because I think they really help us put in perspective what we need to do in every single message. Right? We've got to wake up to where we are, the reality of where we are. It is not to point or condemn or to bust somebody over the head, but it's simply to provide a reminder to wake up maybe in some areas that we're falling short. To listen up to God's word because hopefully going to bring some truth of God's word to you 
that you will be, will be helpful, will be encouraging, will be challenging, yes, but will be transformative in your life. To wake up, to, to listen up, to step up. Really, I want, my prayer is, is that some of the men in our church today, this morning, will, will take this next step up in their journey of faith. To take this next step up, whatever it might be, out of these 12 things that we identify this morning of where you know and you might even tick them as you go along. This is an area I need God to work on me in. And then to look up. Because let's just be honest, men. We can't be the husbands we really ever want to be. We can try really hard. We can work really hard. We can commit all we want to commit. We can like, I'm going to do better. And by the end of next week, we'll stop. We'll forget what we want. We, we should, but we don't, right? And so we have to depend. We have to look and say, oh, God, I can't do this. I can't live up to this standard. Only as I rest in you, as I rely on you, as I depend on you, as I look up to you, can I do these things. So 12 things I want to challenge us with this morning. Number one. I want to encourage you, men, that we would love and live for Christ. That we would love and live for Christ. By the way, these 12 things will not be earth-shattering. You'll not go, man, I've never thought about that before. I think these will be things we already know, but we need these reminders from time to time. And as I went through this list together, I'm reminded in my own life of areas I need to improve in. But the first one, we have to start here. Men, you can do everything else on this list. Listen to me carefully. You can do every single thing else on this list. But if you miss this one, you've missed it all. If you miss the first thing of who your first love must be, then everything else will never, ever fall in place. Now, I'm not saying you won't have a pretty good marriage because you will. If you did these other 11 things on a regular basis, you'd probably have a pretty good marriage. But you'll never have the fulfillment spiritually of what God designed and wants you to have and wants me to have if I don't love Christ supremely above everything else, including my spouse, including myself, including anything else that I might put there that I might say that I love, my job, my hobbies, that I make him the number one priority in my life. Which means if he's number one, that means I have to make some adjustments for a lot of us. We've got to carve out some more time to spend time with the Lord. We've got to carve out some time to spend time praying for our wives, for our children. We have to carve out time to spend time with men who might encourage us to grow in our faith and walk with the Lord. But I need to love Christ. And as I love Christ, then I'm going to live for him, right? I want you to notice it's in this order. I'm not calling us to live for Christ first. We're called to fall in love with Jesus. And as we fall in love with Jesus more and more and understand what it means to be a godly man, then the follow-up, the result will be that I will desire. It will be a natural outflow that I want to live like Jesus. Man, if I were to take all of you out of this room and I just had just your wives and I were to ask them the number one thing, what they would want more than anything else from you. If they were really honest They would want you to be deeply in love with Jesus. Because you know the secret is, if you're deeply in love with Jesus, you're going to be deeply in love with your spouse. And you will love them and you will sacrifice for them and you will serve them because you understand your biblical call as you fall in love with Jesus of what you and I are called to be. So number one, may we as men love and live for Jesus. Secondly, Love her. That's pretty deep, isn't it? You never thought about that, did you? Love my wife. Thank you, Pastor. That is so deep. We just can stop there and go home. Love her. Now, when I hear this word, love her, I can't help it because we're so thankful for modern day cable and this brand new great channel that came out about five years ago. It becomes the bane of my existence sometimes, the Hallmark Channel. Men, this is a good opportunity. We can't point elbows later, but men... How, how many of you, your wives, watch the Hallmark Channel and you know it? Raise your hand, man. Look, look here. Mm. How many of you have been sucked into one of these movies accidentally? Be honest. It's okay. This is a good confession session. I have to. Y'all, I, 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 I have to confess it before my fellow brothers. I, y'all, I taped one of these the other day. And, and I already know exactly how it's going to turn out. I mean, every time it's the same story. Some guy's going to come back in and he's going to get mad and I don't like you. And, and with his six minutes left, about 7.53, it shifts and changes. The kiss happens and they live happily ever after. You know, it's just a load of, I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? But it's this romance, right? And our wives, men, can I just give us a word though, right? 
Why are they watching these movies? Okay? We would call them back in the day a chick flick. Some daring man said that. That was good. Chick, chick flick. Right? A chick flick, right? We rather watch people shoot people, wreck cars, right? Bloody. We want to watch like, you know, action stuff, right? We got to sit down and watch a man and a woman actually have to talk and communicate. And then it gets really ooey gooey. And we're like, oh, gross. I can never do that. I don't want to be like this. It's gross, right? But do you know what your wife needs from you? She needs you to love her. Not necessarily in the Hallmark Channel kind of way, right? Because that's not reality. Snow does not fall magically from heaven when you had your first kiss with your spouse, right? I mean, this didn't happen, right? I can hardly wait for Christmas. It's coming. Oh, I actually thought about starting a Hallmark support group for men. I really did, just to kind of help us get through Christmas. But here's the kicker. Sometimes we look at that and we go, yuck. And if we're not careful, we go the other way, right? Because we think now, here's the part where, where masculinity can be a little toxic. Well, I'm beyond that. I'm past that. That's not for me. But our, our wives need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love her. Now, all of us have different love languages. We communicate that differently on how we love our spouse and how they receive love. But I would, I would dare you to ask your... Now, wives, why don't you be honest? Okay, sometimes this might be a little difficult of conversations. I understand that. But don't lie. Do you know I really love you? You would ask her. Do you know I really love you? Right, because I meet men from time to time. They've never, ever told their wife they love them. Well, she knows I love her. I'm still here. Well, praise God. That's great, man. That's awesome. That helps her out a lot. Yeah. Right? I don't mean that you have to cry and be all weepy, right, and those kind of things. I just mean that have you told her that you love her? Have you shown her that you love her? Is she secure in your love. And this is what the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 28 and verse 33. It says this, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Interesting, isn't it? For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. So again, I say each man, verse 33, must love his wife as he loves himself. It appears Paul is writing to men to say, hey guys, it's very obvious you love yourself. <laughs> right? You need to love your wife more than you love yourself. And the rest of these will show you how to love your wife, by the way. The third one is this, lead her. Lead her. Ephesians 5, 23 says, For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. Now, I'm going to say unashamedly, this is not a misogynist statement, okay? It is a biblical statement. The way God designed the home to work right is for the man to lead his family. Now, here's the problem. This is why we have this misogynist view of the idea of men leading is because we've given terrible examples of what it looks like. We've seen them. Men that lord it over their wives, expect them that they're the king of their castle and you must serve me and you do whatever I say and however I say it and whenever I say it. It goes to the extreme of abuse and, and people take these passages and use them wrongly that God never intended for you see, when the idea of leading is more the idea of a shepherd, it's not something behind something, slapping it and moving it forward, but instead it's one that leads from the front with kindness and gentleness and tenderness. See, men, I've had conversations with ladies over the years, and the one other thing I've heard them say is, I just wish my husband would lead my home spiritually. I wish he'd lead. Men, if we're not careful, we get in these ruts that would we'll be more than happy to let our wives set the spiritual temperature of our home. Now, ladies, I'm going I'm to get to you next week and encourage you as well. You have a vital part to play in that. But men, may you not, may I not abdicate that responsibility to my wife and say that's her job. Men, so goes the home, your spiritual condition of your home is how you lead it. And by the way, how do you lead? You lead her by serving her, by loving her, by tenderly sacrificing for her. Ladies will have no problem following a man who loves her and serves her and cares for her and treats her as if she is the queen of 
the universe. So when it comes time for a man to lead in a direction, there is not something of putting on the brakes and saying, oh, I don't trust you, I don't like you, I don't, love, I don't like what you do. Instead, there's a willingness, this idea of submission we'll talk about next week, that has gotten completely slammed and, and skewed of what it ever really intended to be. It's a partnership together. But man, you're called to take the first step out. You're called to take the lead. In the same example, if something was happening to your family, what would you men, what would you do? If your family was in jeopardy, what would you do, men? Tell me, what would you do? What would you tell your kids or your wife to do? Stand beside you? Stand where? Behind me. Think about that for a moment, guys. Nobody had to teach you that. Nobody said, well, I'm going to be a male chauvinist. Y'all get behind me. No. It's instinct. It's God-given. Right? Get behind me. Why? I'm going to protect you. I will lead you to a safe place. That's the condition that our homes need to be, guys. That we would lead our homes in a way that God would have us to. So, man, I know some of these are going to hurt our feelings because if our, if our wives are really honest, I know I'm already in trouble. I'm only in number four and I'm already going to not get the answers I want. I know it. But I want to know. Am I leading my home spirits the way I need to? In some areas, I may be doing okay, but in other areas, I, I slack. Fourthly, notice this next one. This is a good one. Lean on her. Lean on her. Now, some of you are going, now, that's really perplexing, preacher. He just said, lead her. How can I lead her and lean on her all at the same time? I need to be out front. I, it's kind of lonely out in the front. I've got to lead no matter what. Put on my tough skin. I've got to, got to tough it out, right? But I want to encourage you. Your wife needs to know you need her. Now, this is what I preach from by experience. We didn't get married until I was 30 years old. I'd lived single a long time and much to the shock of my teenagers at the time. I don't know how they ever thought that I ever did anything in life till I got married. They wondered, you know, how did I have clean clothes? How did I eat anything? Like I was completely incapacitated, basically, is the way they looked at it. You become very independent when you get married at a little older age, right? You don't have those habits. You have to set those habits and patterns if you get married a little bit later. So I, in my ministry life, too, I just, I didn't need anybody. I was a wall. Nobody got in this wall because I'd been hurt a few times and I decided that nobody's going to get in this wall. And so I had it walled off. And then we started dating and we got married and I would look at her and man, I could read her. I could read her like a book. I'm telling you, I knew most of the time what she's thinking. She's a terrible liar, which is really great. She can never lie very good. And so if I'd ask her something, she'd say, are you happy? And she'd be like, yeah. I'm like, you're lying. I can tell. I said, I would say, I would, I would, I would like, I would almost be puffed up. I know you. And I felt real puffed up till one day she looked at me. She said, I don't know you. Hmm. That seems to be a problem. I wasn't sure at the moment I really wanted her to know me. See, sometimes we're scared if we're not careful of intimacy. Intimacy, the word into me see. We're afraid sometimes if somebody really knows who we are, they might not really like us anymore. So we began this kind of a running joke over the years of, do you know me now? I had to begin to peel some layers back. I had to begin to be more open because I had everything close to the chest. And basically, it communicated to her I didn't need her. But over the years, I have learned, I hope, to lean into her because I need her. I'll just be honest with you. I'm a hot mess without her. I'm good for about two days, and after that, it's not good. Lean on her, men. Ladies provide a different perspective for us sometimes, right? I tend to be gruff, and I have little patience sometimes with my children. They provide a nice different perspective from time to time. Lean on her. So ask her this week, do I lean on you enough? Fifth. This is a good one right here. Men, this is, the, this is the, ladies, keep your elbows to yourself right now. Don't do it. Don't even look at him. Ladies, look right up here. Hey, men, look somewhere else, okay? Listen to her. 
Oh, the dread, ladies, that you, you could hit us, beat us. I don't know what else you could do to us. But when we hear these words, did you hear what I just said? The oh crud factor that comes over our lives of scrambling for all we're worth. Oh, God, I prayed it. Oh, God, please don't remember like five words of what she said. I really wanted to hear it. But there was a touchdown happening right at the moment. She wanted my attention. Or I just wasn't interested, and so I didn't really tune in. Or I was listening to somebody else's conversation. We struggle as men to listen. But good news. They have released a medicine, ladies, that you need to buy. Check this out. Men, how many times has this happened to you? To me. You know, we, our babies sleep really, really good. Or this. Make sure Timmy wears the blue shirt. If he doesn't. Or even this. And for my birthday, which is next month, I'd really like some of this. Do you have trouble listening or retaining information from your wife? You could be suffering from... Spousal Selective Listening, or SSL. With SSL, valuable input is intercepted or scrambled before it reaches the critical learning center of the man brain. Virtually anything can trigger it, like sports, food, even shiny objects with buttons. Fortunately, there is help with Heratol. Containing a rare root with an exotic name, Heratol helps men focus and listen to valuable female input, even pick up on those subtle hints. These are exactly the earrings I wanted. How did you know? Thanks, Heratol. Now I can hear it all. Heratol has not been tested or approved by any regulatory agency. Side effects with Heratol include minor to severe headaches and spontaneous combustion. Use caution when using Heratol near mothers-in-law, as you may hear hurtful comments that would have previously been ignored. Heratol is an enhancement drug. Do not use around children or clusters of talkative old blue-haired women. If focused listening lasts longer than four hours, consult your doctor immediately before your wife assumes this is a new standard in your relationship. Men with wives who are nursing or pregnant should not take this product. Heratol, the preferred selection or solution for selective hearing. That's good stuff right there. So... Uh, you can order a bottle, 1-800, whatever that number is. You, want, you need to go back and watch it again. The, the fine print right there was good. If this hearing lasts more than, anyway, so it's good. I just, you'll take time to look at that later. Man, bottom line is this. We already know it. We have to listen. Now, here's what's funny is when you go to talk to these psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors, they'll say we have to add new words to define things, right? We used to say, I can love you. That's good enough. But we have to add the word unconditional. We add the word listening. We have to actually add a word to that. It's the word actively listening, right? We have to engage, right? And I've often told my wife, listen, if you get a hint, two words in, I'm not listening, would you just do me a favor and just stop and say, hey, you're not listening to me? That would help me out a lot because I don't really necessarily mean to do it. And if some of us that are like me, you add ADHD on top of it, it's just a disaster in the making, right? So we've got to, men, intentionally listen. Now, here's the kicker about this. When we listen to our spouse, the challenge for us as men is to just this, oh, it's so hard for me. You just got to be quiet. Ladies, most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, you just want your husband to listen. What do we do, men? They start telling us a problem. Men, what do we try to do? Instantaneously. Ladies, don't answer. Men, what? Fix it, right? I'm off your great solution. I think, man, I've got it. I can tell you what you need to do. All they want us to do is listen. So if you're brave and bold, ask her how you're doing in the listening area. <laughs> Buy her lunch first. All right, sixthly, be loyal to her. Be loyal to her. And be loyal to her, I mean by when you're with her and when you're not with her. When you're with her in your physical presence or even in your mind. That you are loyal to her. That she knows no matter what, you are there for her. No matter what she looks like, how much weight she might gain or lose, what happens to her physically doesn't matter that she knows that she is secure one of a woman's greatest needs and wants is security and that is found men when they know that we are loyal to them seventh laugh with her 
laugh with her. Laughter is so important. I, I cannot even, we, we live in a world that's sad enough all the time. There's very little laughter ever on TV, right? I, that's why I love, I love a good Christian comedian. I loved John Chris. I love to watch him. There's another guy, uh, Tim Hawkins, who's got some great stuff. And man, this is a great way um, to laugh, but also a word of encouragement of a song that you might not want to sing to your wife. Just take a look. I did the choreography myself. Hey, honey, have you gained some weight in your rear end? The dress you wear reminds me of my old girlfriend. And where'd you get those shoes? I think they're pretty lame. Would you stop talking cuz I'm trying to watch the game? If you're a man who wants to live a long and happy life, these are the things you don't say to your wife. I planned a hunting trip next week on your birthday I didn't ask you but I knew it'd be okay Go make some dinner while I watch this fishing show I taped it over our old wedding video If you're a man who've done that A long and happy life Lives up the place you tell it to you Solo! Okay! Your cooking is okay, but not like mother makes The diamond in the ring I bought you is a fake Your eyes look puffy, dear, are you feeling ill? Happy anniversary, I bought you a treadmill If you're a man who wants to live a long and happy life, that too These are the things you don't say to me If you're a man who doesn't want to get killed with a knife These are the things you don't say to me That's good stuff. All right, so you need to laugh with your wife. Find ways to laugh. Learn to laugh at yourself. Learn to laugh at situations. Learn to laugh. Laughter is a great medicine, is it not? Notice the next one. Lighten her load. Find ways to help her, okay? Now, ladies, when we ask this question, please, for the love of all that's good, don't give us a list of honeydews a mile long. Just give us one. That, that'd be great, right? Just give us one to start with. Have you thought about lately, because too often we get consumed with ourselves, what can I do to help lighten her load? Whether your wife works or not, does not matter? How can you lighten her load? In whatever area of life that might be of help and a benefit to her. Have you asked that question lately? Right? I grew up in a house. My dad um, was a great man, loved, loved him, but um, I never, ever, until I was way out of the house and out of college, and um, I didn't, I'm not sure my dad even knew how to wash a dish of any kind. He didn't, know how to, he didn't load the dishwasher. When, lunch, when supper was over, he pushed back from the table, usually went to his office to work, and uh, mom cleaned up everything. My dad had no clue how to operate a washing machine at all. Dryer, right? I never saw him, ever, not one time, I never saw him push a vacuum cleaner. Not, not one time. Um, None of those things, right? Now, in latter years, he began to realize that would probably be a helpful, smart idea that if he'd like to, you know, not kill with a knife by his wife. So he decided that would be a better idea. He learned, right? And then how can you help lighten her load? That communicates to her, by the way, when you want to lead somewhere, you've provided and proved to her that I'm here for you. Now, Man, I want to tell you all these things. So you're going, I've got all these things to do. When do I have time for myself? Those times need to happen too. I'm not saying that you do all these things every day, all the time, right? There, there has to be balance in our lives. But how's a way you can lighten her load? Number nine, lift her up. Who in this world doesn't need encouragement? I, I just want you to know, I've never, ever given somebody a compliment. They said, you know what? I'll just be honest with you. Can you just stop right there? I've gotten too much encouragement today. 
You know, I mean, I've had too many people tell me what a great job I'm doing. So if you just kind of tone it down a little bit, I've had enough, you know. Nobody gets enough encouragement. How do you encourage her verbally, right? Men, when we were dating them, we regularly talked about how beautiful they looked. Now they have to ask or, (coughs) right? I hope I don't lose that. It's one thing I, I tend to do somewhat well, especially you weren't here last Sunday, but I talked about when we go to, Coles or somewhere in a dressing room. Yes, yeah, she starts shaking her head. She comes out the dressing room. I tend to be a little bit loud and like, you know, start catcalling and, and, you know, she runs back into the dressing room with utter fear and humiliation, right? But honestly, it's just the truth. If there are any other guys around, I just, I mean, I, I am, I'm just, I'm a little prideful. I'm just like, y'all lost. <laughs> I won. I mean, look at her. Did you, have you looked at me lately? I mean, look what I got. Thank you very much. I'm proud. I'm impressed. I mean, I love when she wants to grab my hand because she actually thinks that I'm with her. That's good. I kind of strut a little bit when she's with me. Lift her up. Encourage her. Brag on her. Encourage her. Men, shoot her a text during the day. Right? I'm terrible at this. I've done good the last two weeks because I've been writing this message. I've been sending texts during the day. Love you. Praying for you. And I mean it. I was hoping it would help me out a little bit too. I'm not going to lie, but I was thinking that would be a good thing to actually do what I'm actually asking everybody else to do, right? I'm praying for you today. I love you. Encourage her about something she's asked me about, we've prayed about together. Whatever is encouraging her. Number 10, learn her emotional needs and how to avoid withdrawals. Now, again, I don't have time, and I mentioned this last week, and these are, now, men, I know, I know this is going to fall on deaf ears. When I mention the word book, all of a sudden, men go, right? I don't read, preacher. Real men don't read. Okay, well, then buy it on audiobook and let it read it to you. Okay? When you have time to read, this is a great investment. Because sometimes, men, we don't really honestly know how to love our wives. We just really don't. Sometimes we get an idea, they can communicate to us, but sometimes we still miss it. These two books, uh, Fall in Love, Stay in Love, and His Needs and Her Needs, Building an Affair Proof Marriage, are great resources to help you understand how you can make more deposits in their love banks than you make withdrawals. Right? Now, these are the top five that he lists, or maybe others, but top five things to pour into her that will deposit into her account, if you will, of giving these things, affection, okay? Now, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain I'm going to do a message in a few more weeks on this topic because some of you ladies, when men hear the word affection, you know what they're thinking. Oh, come on, good night. <laughs> okay, I'll just laugh, that's fine. Uh, affection, they're thinking about something a little further than just a kiss, right? But ladies need your affection, Okay? Lady, your conversation, right? Some of us struggle in this area. They've, they've got great books of conversation starters. If you think about running out of things to do, running out of things to talk about. They want to have conversation with you. Thirdly, honesty and openness. That's that leaning in part, transparency, intimacy, financial support, and family commitment. That you're deeply committed to your family. Those are things that deposit into her account. Those are her top five emotional needs. Things that withdraw, they call them love busters. For either side are selfish demands, disrespectful judgments, angry outbursts, annoying behavior, and dishonesty. Learn her, right? If you have to, treat it like it's a science fair project because to try to figure her out can kind of be like that. But here's the thing. Why don't you think about this, man, for a moment? If you have something that you're trying to figure out Okay, if you're like me, the last thing I want to do is read an instruction manual. The only time in our marriage we've ever really had a, what I really call a serious fight. Right, it's the only time it involved an instruction manual. And I would encourage you, if you ever don't want to have a fight, do not buy a swing set of any kind. There are too many bolts, too many steps that can be mistaken. We got it all the way to the end and a bolt was in backwards. And I blew a gasket. I think my voice was loud. I was ticked off. I was mad. I was hot. I wanted to destroy that swing set. I didn't care if my kids ever had one at that moment. 
But what do we have to do? If we got to figure, we got to, we got to get an instruction manual, right? If it's something I'm really passionate about, something I want to make sure that it works, I fix it, whatever it is. Now, of course, for getting instruction manuals, we have YouTube to tell us how to put, you know, things together or take them apart or get yourself out of a big quag, right? If you watch YouTube, you can watch some YouTube videos. Find out and invest in your wife of knowing what it is that builds up those deposits in her bank. And learn, too, what are the things that you do that withdraw. So then again, I'm going to challenge you. Take this outline home and ask your wife, how am I doing in depositing in your account? And then the hard part, how am I withdrawing? But think about it, man. What if you knew that? What if your wife actually said, if you would help me in these areas, and if you would not do these things, right? Some of them we already know when we start hearing these things, we're like, oh, yeah, I need to work on this and work on that, right? But sometimes we just need to hear it to know what it is. Notice the last two. Lay down your life for her. Ephesians 5, 25, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church, he gave himself up for her, or he gave up his life for her. I I don't think necessarily Paul meant here, though it certainly is an application, that you literally, in this call, are called to die for your wife. So that certainly might happen to somebody, that you might die so that they don't. But for most of us, that's probably never going to happen. But what's even harder, maybe, is to die to yourself. To die to what you want. To die to what you like. To die to the things that you think you have to have. That you're willing to lay down your life for her. So ask her, have I laid down my life for you? And if she says yes, bonus star is for you. If she says no, ladies, tell him how. Okay, again, men are a little slow, ladies, on this topic. Spell it out clearly. How can he lay down his life for you? It's a biblical command. Lay it down. Lastly. There's no L for this one as disturbing as that makes it for me, Mr. Alliteration. Pray with her. Pray with her. Pray for her and with her. I'm going to be very personal. I don't know why this is such a hard one for couples to do, but it is. At least for most that I've been around. And it's even hard for me a lot of times. And I think I know why it's hard. Here's what I know to be true. If you and I spent more time praying for our spouse. And a daily time of praying with them. I believe this would be true. Marriages would be a whole lot stronger. There'd be a whole lot less fights and a whole lot less divorces. But most men I talk to about this topic, myself included, and it's true, if my head hits the pillow, unless there's a football game on, and even then there's no guarantee, I am gone. So if we're going to have to have listening and conversation, it's going to have to be when I am sitting upright, right? Satan wants to keep you from the thing that can bring the greatest intimacy in your marriage, and that is to pray with your spouse. Now, for some reason, I don't know why, I pray with a billion people a week. It's a little bit of exaggeration, but I pray with a lot of people. But for some reason, when I pray with my wife sometimes, it's awkward. I'm just being honest with you. I don't know why. The one reason it's awkward is usually when I start praying with her, nine times out of ten, I can't help it, I usually start crying. But I'll tell you one thing that will bring you to a place of praying for your spouse is when you find yourself in a place of desperation. It didn't feel very awkward then. 
Five years ago, six years ago, we walked through some dark, dark days together. A lot of tears, a lot of heartache. And then this in this moment, men, we find ourselves feeling, watch this, and I'm going to be really personal with you as we close. We find ourselves feeling very helpless. And ladies, can I just give you a clue? When a man feels like he can't do nothing to help a situation, a man is at his most vulnerable point. Because we want to lead, we want to protect, we want to fix it. But man, there are just some times we just flat out can't do it. And then we're reminded to do what we should have been doing all along. And in those dark nights at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, all I could do is cry and pray over my wife. That's all I could do. And then when you get through with that, you think, oh, well, everything's just going to be perfectly better. <laughs> Because I prayed. Guess what happened the next night? It was a long, dark night. And nothing I said would help. So all I could do was pray. I prayed for her. And I prayed over her. Men, I promise you, your wife, if you looked at her on the way home, and say, would you mind if we prayed together? I bet you there's not a single woman here who would say, you know what, I'd just rather you not pray for me. <laughs> if you can get the courage to pray out loud over her. Ask her, what can I pray with you about? Sometimes in marriages, we try to fix our spouse. Do you ever go into marriage thinking, you know what, I'm going to fix them. I'm going to get them straight. And you realize about six months in that that's not a snowball's chance that's going to happen. Which leads to arguments and fights and disagreements. When the best thing you can do for them is pray for them. Best book anybody gave me before I got married, years before I got married actually. I actually began praying for Rebecca years before I ever met her. It's called The Power of a Praying Husband. The Stormy O. Martin. Good news, men. The chapters are very short. They're like four pages. And at the end of each of these chapters, it gives you a prayer that you could pray for your spouse in all the areas of her life that she needs it. And I'll promise you, if you begin to pray for your spouse, things can begin to change. You see, what we need in our churches more than anything else and what our nation needs are healthy, godly families led by men, strong yet humble, compassionate, courageous, and men full of conviction who love Jesus more than anything else in this world and love their spouse right behind that more than anything else in this world. Hard to do? Absolutely. So, man, I want to challenge you this week. Look at your spouse. Take this list together this week with no kids around means you might have to get up a little earlier, stay up a little later, go to lunch, take her to lunch. If we really want to have a marriage that is fulfilling and a marriage that God would honor, if we would be the men that God would call us to be. So I pray this morning you've woken up, you've listened up, you pray now, what is my next step up? And let us all look up and say, God, help me. Let's pray together.